on F. Kennedy Jr. A Nation Waits continues once again. Peter Jennings. This search for JFK Jr. and his wife and his wife's sister Lauren will continue through the night. The Air Force is now bringing in a couple of helicopters, or at least one helicopter, that has an infrared device which will enable them to continue to search throughout the evening. The Massachusetts police are sending divers uh, to the area. Uh, one of the, the uh, ships belonging uh, to the uh, National Oceanographic Association is coming up from Montauk to put a fish or an electronic scanning device into the bottom of the ocean. They continue to find personal items um, from the aircraft itself and uh, many have been brought in by members of the public. Public reminded that if you keep a piece of debris from anything like this, it's an arrestable offense. But in fact, that suitcase did, it's now been confirmed by the Boston police, belong to Lauren Bissett, the sister, and they also found a prescription bottle belonging to Carolyn Kennedy, so the evidence of tragedy um, continues to mount. And as we said, in the course of this two hours, what we wanted to do was to try to focus on the mystery, which is becoming less of a mystery all the time, except perhaps what happened to the aircraft, um, and the general history of America's connection with this family, which has been uh, an experience of both triumph and tragedy. Here's ABC's Ted Koppel. There has probably never been a family in American public life more envied and more pitied than the Kennedys. Rich, famous, handsome, powerful, and yet a family blighted by more personal tragedy than you would think any single family, however large, could bear. Several of the tragedies that afflicted this family struck before the Kennedys were quite as prominent on the American landscape as they would eventually become. Joseph Kennedy, the acknowledged patriarch of the Klan, himself the product of a privileged background, Boston Latin School, Harvard University, was a brutally tough businessman who made his fortune in the Roaring Twenties. Banking, movies, bootlegging. Well, I think even as a bully, he would uh, uh, really uh, almost blackmail people. Uh, he would pay off people, uh, really almost uh, anything to get ahead, make money. Did he ever cross the line into illegality? I mean, it is, it is often said that he was a bootlegger. Yeah, no, that's no question that he was a boot, bootlegger. Uh, his family was in the liquor business before Prohibition. All of a sudden, at the end of Prohibition, he was in the liquor business. He sold his stock before the market crashed in 29, and on that fortune, he built a political dynasty. His wife, Rose whom Americans would see fleetingly over the next 60 some odd years. The constant pillar of faith and strength as the family plunged from triumph to disaster and back again. And any one of us who has children, the horror and the nightmare is what happens if one of them dies? I, I don't know how you could handle it. How could she have handled over and over and over again, in fact, the whole family, but particularly her? And living as long as she did and seeing one after the other after the other uh, go down in the most horrifying of ways. Their oldest son, Joe Kennedy Jr., he was the one supposed to be the first Kennedy in the White House. But in 1944, flying on a secret mission from England to Calais, France, Joe was killed. The plane itself, loaded with explosives, was intended to blow up a German bunker. The crew was to parachute to safety. Joseph Kennedy was 29. This was Joe Kennedy's younger sister, Rosemary. The family had always maintained that she was retarded. When she was 23, doctors recommended a lobotomy. It failed. Believe it or not, that was a myth that Joe Kennedy created because it was more, it was less embarrassing to say that she was retarded than to say the truth, which is that she was mentally ill. She had a, a form of mental illness, uh, s essentially uh, something like manic depression. They had some name for it in those days. Rosemary has been institutionalized since the operation in 1941. She's now 80. Then in 1948, still before most Americans had become aware of the Kennedy family and its ambitions, another plane crash and another Kennedy youngster dead, Kathleen Kennedy. She was 28. In years to come, as this young man would steadily climb the political ladder running first for Congress and then for the U.S. Senate and ultimately for the presidency itself, 
these earlier tragedies would become a part of the fabric of the Kennedy story. But most of us only learned about these events later, when the country as a whole began to focus on this young man attempting to become the first Catholic in the White House. There was, certainly was a prejudice against Catholics. There was always concern that the Pope would, you know, call the shots. Uh, but Joe had the answer. He uh, put uh, Jack into TV acting lessons, which was unheard of in those days. Uh, and you could see the result in the Nixon-JFK uh, debate. And uh, Joe also made sure that he paid off the right people. By the narrowest of margins, John Kennedy defeated Richard Nixon for the presidency in 1960. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. He charmed and he outraged. It's difficult now to remember how angry people were at the arrogance of this new president appointing his own brother, Attorney General of the United States. But those were the glory days. In 1962, Ted Kennedy would be elected U.S. Senator from Massachusetts. And there they were, Jack, the President, Bobby, the Attorney General, Teddy, the Senator, and all of them young with long lives stretching out ahead of them. He and she and the children were picture perfect. Nobody wrote about presidential infidelities or indiscretions in those days, Although, as it later turned out, there would have been plenty to write about. There was a hit musical on Broadway celebrating King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table at a place called Camelot. That's how Jackie Kennedy wanted these times to be remembered, as Camelot. In late November of 1963, as part of the run-up to the 64 elections, John Kennedy paid a campaign visit to Dallas. Something has happened here. Something is wrong here. Something is terribly wrong. And this, for many years to come, would be the image of John Kennedy Jr. saluting the caisson carrying his father's coffin that would be seared into our memories. John John. And standing nearby, his uncle, Robert F. Kennedy, now carrying all the burdens and soon to carry the hopes and ambitions of the Kennedy clan. Clearly, the sense of tragedy, the sense of fatalism, the family curse or the family legacy uh, did transform him. Before and during his brother's administration, Bobby Kennedy had always been known as the tough guy, the hatchet man, the enforcer. After the assassination, he became the protector of the legacy. There had never been much love lost between President Lyndon Johnson and Bobby Kennedy, Kennedy thought that the war in Vietnam was destroying America. More and more he came to believe that perhaps he should challenge Lyndon Johnson for the presidency in 1968. And by June 5th, the night of the California primary, the Democratic nomination was effectively his. President Johnson had announced that he wouldn't run again. My thanks to all of you, and now it's on to Chicago, and let's win there. It looked as though another Kennedy might be about to win the presidency in his own right. We've heard an alarming report that Robert Kennedy was shot. Oh, my God. Senator Kennedy has been shot. Be very careful. Get the gun. Get the gun. He would linger for another day. When Bobby Kennedy died, he was 42. Everyone now assumed that the mantle would pass to the next brother in line, Senator Ted Kennedy. But only a year after his brother John was shot, Ted Kennedy was aboard a private plane when it crashed. One of the senator's aides, Edward Moss, was killed. Kennedy's back was broken. Then, five years later, 30 years ago tomorrow, as it turns out, on July 18, 1969, Ted Kennedy was involved in an incident that was far more damaging to his presidential hopes than anything that had happened before. Driving home after a party on Chappaquiddick Island, Kennedy drove off a bridge and into the water below. He survived, but a young woman with him, Mary Jo Kopechny, drowned and was later recovered from the submerged car. In 1980, Senator Kennedy would challenge incumbent Jimmy Carter for the Democratic nomination. But Chappaquiddick 
would always stand between Ted Kennedy and the White House. But perhaps the most remarkable thing about the story of the Kennedys is that they fluctuate as a family between tragedy and triumph. And just when it looked as though Ted Kennedy had disqualified himself from any chance at political greatness, he began to emerge as one of the most effective senators of our time. Many people who had gone through the assassinations of two brothers and a plane crash of his own, which happened within four years, would have dropped out. Uh, and he doesn't. He just keeps plugging away. And legislatively, he's developed probably one of the, certainly one of the strongest legislative records of anybody who's ever served in the Senate. What is so staggering about the Kennedy saga, though, is the sheer volume of tragedy that the family has endured. In 1973, Ted Kennedy's son, Edward Jr., had his right leg amputated because of cancer. In 1986, son Patrick, then a teenager, sought treatment for cocaine addiction. Patrick Kennedy is now a congressman from Rhode Island. Among Robert and Ethel Kennedy's 11 children, these incidents. Son Joseph, involved in an automobile accident that left a female passenger paralyzed for life. Young Joe Kennedy also served as a congressman from Massachusetts. Robert Jr. arrested and charged with heroin possession in 1983. He is now a leading environmental activist. Sons David and Michael are among the many Kennedys who died far too young. Uh, I, I think the one that's probably the worst is David. Uh, that was probably the greatest tragedy. This was a child who was watching television when his father was assassinated as Bobby's son. So he went on uh, heavily into drugs. He was down in Florida, down in Palm Beach. Uh, someone, uh, possibly one of the his family members, got him some drugs that were from his uh, grandmother, uh, who was quite ill. And the drugs, which nobody knew, uh, caused you to stop breathing. Uh, really kind of a wasted life, a kid who went on uh, constantly running and no one was able to reach him. And that's probably the greatest tragedy within that family. And then the, the bizarre skiing accident with Michael. Yes, and that to me is, is kind of typical of the arrogance you'd hope that they wouldn't have. Here is a kid who uh, was filming, who was using a video camera, he was playing, playing football all while skiing. The uh, family had been warned not to do that. The uh, uh, ski patrol had warned them repeatedly, and it was an arrogance. It wasn't a case of great athletic prowess. It was a case of just being foolish. Among the stories involving young Kennedys, few received more public attention than the 1991 charges against William Kennedy Smith. The nephew of John and Robert and Ted was accused, and then later acquitted, of raping a woman at the family's Palm Beach estate. He has gone on to become a medical doctor. But there is also Kathleen Kennedy Townsend, Lieutenant Governor of Maryland, considered one of the brightest political prospects in the country, and JFK's daughter, Caroline. Caroline is uh, <laughs> living a normal life, which is an amazing situation. She's a non-practicing attorney. She's a, an author with some success with books related to the Constitution. Uh, she's a mother. She's living a normal life, and that in itself is remarkable with uh, some private personal successes. In most American families, it is deemed notable when someone is elected to Congress or to the Senate, and certainly to the White House. Only among the Kennedys is it remarkable when someone leads what could be described as a normal life. I spoke with Haynes Johnson and Ron Kessler, two journalists and authors who have written a good deal about the Kennedys. If I apply the word courage uh, to any of the Kennedys, uh, Appropriate, inappropriate, uh, over-dramatized? Well, of course it's over-dramatized, and it's part of the mythology, and uh, uh, from the Greeks on, we, we love mythology, but uh, John Kennedy did, mythology notwithstanding, do something very great in the Pacific. When he saved those sailors and almost broke his back after PT-109 went in, and uh, taking them back with his teeth and, uh, cr across that great expanse of water. So there was instantaneous courage. I get his brother Joe him flying on that dangerous mission out of London, a secret mission. The plane blew up, uh, knowing that it was a highly charged risk. So I uh, clearly it is. I don't know how we 
Hemingway's 100 years old now, and uh, so I, a lot of us were formed on the Hemingway myth about courage and manliness and, and uh, all that, and maybe the Kennedys were too. Uh, but uh, clearly, uh, they did take risks, for sure, and they did exhibit, at times, some courage. Be a little careful here, Ron, not to, not to cross the line into amateur psychology, but I, I speak to you now as someone who spent a lot of time looking into the lives, the motivations, the drive of different members of the Kennedy family. What is it about the Kennedys that, that causes them always to seem to want to push a little bit too far? You know, it's hard to know if it's genetics or it's the culture, um, or the genetics lead to the culture, but certainly there is a culture in the, in the Kennedy family of uh, taking risks, of knowing no fear, of considering it to be uh, unmanly, if you will, to, to be cautious. Uh, I interviewed Dr. Robert Watt, who was the family physician, and he said the family knew no fear. The kids were always doing something totally crazy. Was that part of the family, I say was, is that part of the family ethos? If you're a Kennedy, you're not afraid. If you're a Kennedy, you take risks. If yeah. you're a Kennedy, and so on and so on. Kennedys don't lose. Kennedys are winners. Kennedys are heroic. We charge the mountains. Uh, uh, we, we save people in the waters. Uh, we fly planes and we blow up uh, uh, and we crash, but we sort of come back the next generation. Uh, we carry the load. It's just an incredible kind of thing. It's, it's, it's not even a clan story. It's so human a tragedy and so enduring one now for 30 some years. Actually, you go back longer than that. Joe Kennedy, the, the oldest brother, when he dies in the plane crash in World War II. Uh, the, the sister Kick Kennedy, she dies in a terrible plane accident. And on and on and on and the tragedy and then also this keeping coming back. I, none of us, any of us who watched American life or world life or written anything has ever seen anything like it and here we are again. You know, there's no question that, that human beings love to have celebrities, uh, heroes, kings and queens. We don't have a king and queen in this country and we're always looking for someone that we can admire. The Kennedys played into that. The Kennedys were very good at manipulating, at, uh, at uh, creating a celebrity st status. It's um, something that uh, where, where the, the reality has been embellished upon. Scotty Reston, James Reston, the great uh, correspondent for the New York Times, the, the day Kennedy died, said, we'll be writing books about him for 300 years and they will be in the form of plays. It's a Shakespearean story because it's got all of those things in there. It's like Lady Macbeth, it's like, it's like Macbeth, it's like Richard III, it's, it's, uh, it's tragedy, it's, it's success, it's uh, too much success, too early, too young. Uh, it's all of those things, and you had all of it wrapped up in this one family over and over and over again. So we're all part of that Kennedy lore, that fable, that uh, tragedy, and it's also something else. These favored people, young, handsome, good-looking, everything in the world, all the money, all the compounds of life and uh, advantages and so forth, flying off in your own airplane, surrounded by beautiful women, uh, generation after generation, and they all come down in flames like Icarus, flying too high to the sun. There's something, uh, you, you named the fable, Ted, you're a writer too, and uh, better than I, and that it's all there to be crafted, and it will be for a long time to come. The Roman emperor and philosopher Marcus Aurelius warned us never to consider a man fortunate until we know the circumstances of his death. How could we have known 36 years ago what lay in store for this man and what appears to have been the fate of that child? Peter? Ted, I'm struck by two things. Uh, first of all, how smart James Reston is when he said we'd be writing books about the Kennedys for 300 years and how good Haynes Johnson is at getting grasping the sense of history that he's written about for so many years in the Washington Post. As you and your staff in Washington prepared this today, what did you finally conclude? You know, I began, Peter, by wondering what we would have been writing or saying about John Kennedy, as they once said about his uncle Edward, if his name had been John Smith. Uh, he was an extraordinarily, I, you see already I'm putting it in the past tense, he is an extraordinarily gifted, handsome young man, went to law school, got his degree, running a magazine. But you have to believe 
that were it not for the relationship with all these other members of the family going back two and three generations now, all of them having lived life to the utmost, having lived at the edge, that he is simply the latest in a long line of people who have had great success and ended in a very tragic way. That's really what's grabbing us all uh, so hard today, I think, is this notion that it's happened before and you just wonder how many more times can it happen to one family. Ted, thanks very much. I think we're all struck by uh, the notion that it happened again to someone who was far too young. All people who've suffered in the Kennedy family, who've died in the Kennedy family, have all been so young. A reminder that his father, when he was killed in 1963, was only 46 years old.